All right, my AP biologists, pull up your britches because this is going to be a good one. We are going to talk about the second half of our chapter five, membrane structure and function. And we are going to focus on why fluids move the way they move across cell membranes. And we're going to be talking about water potential. All right, I'm going to make myself a little smaller. And I want us to start, we've already gone over part one. So if you miss part one, please go and watch that because this will make a lot more sense to you. And I'm going to put us in presentation mode. Okay, there I am in the middle. All right, so um, what we need to know about this is you need to remember that <clears throat> if you are large, large molecule or a charge molecule, you will not pass through a phospholipid bilayer. Okay, if you are large or you are charged, you're going to have to use a channel, a carrier. Um, you'll have to use the whole membrane, endo and exocytosis. But if you are not large and if you are not charged, then you can move right through this phospholipid bilayer. What are some common things that move through there? Oxygen, carbon dioxide, and I know, water. So we're going to talk about that since we are mostly water. We need to understand how water moves across a cell membrane. And then we need to take in consideration that some cells have cell walls. And how does that impact the way um, fluids move? So we talked about aquaporins last time that help facilitate the transfer of water. But what I'm going to talk to you about today when I talk to you about water moving is literally just the process through the phospholipids directly. Okay. So we also talked about last time about passive versus active transport. Long story short on that, passive does not require any energy. You're just going from a higher concentration to a lower concentration. And if you're small, not charged, right, then you can just go from that higher concentration all the way to the other side. That's diffusion. If this substance happens to be water, that's osmosis, okay, that's osmosis. If you use a channel or a carrier, but you still go with the concentration gradient, that is facilitated diffusion. If you are going against the gradient, if you're rolling balls uphill, that's going to take energy, right? And that is called active transport if it requires any ATP. Now, we talked about signal transduction. I'm going to put a pin in that. Okay, so let's go back to diffusion, <clears throat> okay? Just a higher concentration to a lower concentration. If you put sugar in your coffee and stir it up, um, it's going to diffuse throughout that substance. Easy. Okay, if you look here, you've got water and you've got dye crystals somehow magically stacked right on top of each other. Who's going to diffuse? Who? Who? Hopefully, you told me both the water and the dye are going to go from higher concentrations to lower concentrations. Just the kinetic energy, obviously, if there's more heat applied to this, if you stir it, it's going to facilitate that process, put some electricity in there, right? It's going to continue until there's an equal distribution of molecules. All right. Now, diffusion happens all the time. You take a big breath in, oxygen is diffusing across your alveoli into your capillaries, hook it up with your hemoglobin and your red blood cells. CO2 was bicarbonate, it's becoming carbonic acid, and then becoming CO2, and it's getting and diffusing back across, and you're exhaling it. Diffusion happens all the time across your intestines right now. If you've got some food in there, it's diffusing across. But what we want to focus on in the next couple of slides is just the movement of water since we are mostly water. So diffusion, excuse me, osmosis has three parts to it. The diffusion of water across a semi-permeable or selectively permeable membrane. Now, it could be another substance, but usually it is water. So three parts to osmosis. The diffusion of water across the semipermeable membrane. Now, if you look at this, this is like supposed to be a beaker down there at the bottom, and there's a membrane, that yellow part right here, that would be, let me get a pointer. This right here would be a membrane. So just imagine I have a beaker, and the two halves of the beaker are separated by this membrane. Now, when you have this side here on the left and the side on the right, which side, the left or the right, has the greater concentration of water? Hopefully you said on the left because it's pure water right here. The side on the right has a mixture of water and sugar. Now, if I was on a smart board, I'd be grabbing these things and moving them around, but I can't. But you can see these sugar molecules, they could try to pass through. In fact, they want to. They want to go from a higher concentration to a lower concentration, 
but they can't fit through the holes in the membrane. They cannot cross. You shall not pass. But the water molecules are small enough, and so they can. So the water will move from this left side to the right side. Now, whenever you have solutions separated by a membrane, whenever you have solutions separated by a membrane, you always give one in reference to the other, right? So right now, the cup, as you're looking at me, I'm to the right of the cup, right? But um, if I put it over here, I'm to the left of the cup, yeah? So everything is always in reference from one side to the other. So you need to keep that in mind. So the first word I want to teach you is hypertonic. Hyper, like <clears throat> if you had too much sugar, you might be hyper or something. This side right here is hypertonic when you consider the left side because it has more things dissolve, more osmotically active substances here on the right side. So it is hypertonic. Now, if I say this is my right hand, this has to be my left hand in reference to this. So this side, if this is hyper, then this side over here has to be hypo, low. It doesn't have a lot of dissolved substances in it. Now, here's the thing. If it doesn't have a lot of dissolved substances over here on this side, it's the hypotonic side, water will always move from the hypotonic side to the hypertonic side of a membrane. And the way we remember this in my class is water must flow from the hypo. Water must flow from the hypo. So it's gonna go from the hypotonic side of the membrane to the hypertonic side of the membrane, okay? So on your notes, and in the descriptor, I have notes, and we're already at part 5.2, passive transport, passive transport across a membrane. On the introduction, growth and homeostasis are maintained by the constant movement of molecules across membranes. So growth and homeostasis are maintained by the constant movement of molecules across membranes. Diffusion, by definition, is the movement of molecules from a higher concentration to a lower concentration. Higher concentration to a lower concentration. The solution contains a solute, Okay, which would be the solid and a solvent that would be the liquid. So what would these green sugar molecules, these sucrose molecules, by the way, that's a disaccharide of what two things? Yes, please tell me. Glucose and fructose, yes, my friends. So the the sugar molecules right here would be the sol what? Solute, okay, and then the water around it would be a solvent. Okay. It is affected, this movement is affected by temperature by pressure, by electrical currents, and molecular size. Temperature, pressure, electrical currents, and molecular size. Osmosis, I've given you this definition already, is the diffusion of water across a semi-permeable membrane. Diffusion of water across a semi-permeable membrane. All right, <clears throat> let's look at this picture right here. It's already labeled for you here on the left side. It's a hypotonic solution, and this is hyper. Do you understand why? Hopefully you do because this side has more dissolved substances in it and less water. It has more solute and less solvent, right? And water must flow from the hypo, and that's why it makes sense that this water is gonna flow from the left side to the right side. And you know what? It would keep flowing, but something is pushing back, right? What do you think is pushing back on this column of water on the right side? Are you saying gravity? pulling it back, yes, so that would act like pressure to push, so what you're gonna end up doing at some point, the same amount of water molecules that are moving from the left side um, to the right side, the same amount are moving from the right to the left. The water never stops moving, it just, when you don't see a change anymore, that just means the same amount of water is flowing both directions, okay? Let's look at another situation here. Okay, so this is what's called a thistle tube, and I think you can read, even though it's kind of small, there's a 10% solution in the thistle tube, and it's put inside a beaker that has a 5% solution. Now, at the bottom of this thistle tube, right here where I'm highlighting, is a membrane. Okay, so these solutions are separated from a membrane. So before we even go any farther, the green stuff at 10%, right, it's not a molarity, but you want some 10% of some solution, and 5% in, in this water here, right, which way is the water going to flow? Water must flow from the hypo. This 5% has less um, stuff in it, right? Less 
solute in it. And so water is going to flow into the thistle tube. And you can see that's exactly what's happening. See where the level was of the solution. And now it's up here and see how it appears more dilute. So it continues to move in. All right. So this is just a close up of that same picture. It's showing you this is a differentially permeable, like some things can pass, some things can't. Right. And when you do this in a lab, what's going to decide whether it can move or not is just the size of the hole and usually holes in that membrane. And usually what you're using is you're using a membrane that they use um, when somebody has trouble with their kidneys. It's called dialysis tubing. They make it into a tube or it can be in a sheet and basically has tiny little pores in it and molecules can move across that as long as they are small enough. All right, that's pretty easy, right? So let's take a look at this and take just a minute not a lot different from the one I showed you a little bit before. You got another thistle tube, you got a membrane. Here's distilled water. Now, let me tell you something. When you talk about how distilled can you get, the purest level you can get, when we start talking about water potential, the most pure of pure of pure water, then the reading is zero. Okay, water potential of zero. As soon as you start adding anything into that, as soon as you put any salts or sugars, any kind of solute in there, it starts going negative in its water potential. Okay, so water, you can talk about, just introduce another word here, water will always go from a higher water potential to a lower water potential. Keep that in your mind because we're going to add to that. There's an equation you need to know for AP where we use that equation about water potential. Okay, it's easy peasy. So you're going to move from a higher water potential of zero to some negative number because it's got stuff in it. I don't know what its water potential is. We could definitely calculate this water potential, okay? It would be solute potential, negative ICRT, but I'll teach you that later. So anyway, this water is going to move into it, and you can see it's going to continue to move up and in until the weight of the column, the pressure of the weight of the column is equivalent to the water potential inside that beaker. All right, so on your notes, osmosis, you already have the diffusion of water across a semi-permeable membrane. Osmoregulation, this movement of water, maintains water balance and allows organisms to control their internal solute composition and water potential. All right, osmotic pressure is the tendency of water to move across a membrane. The higher the osmotic pressure means more solutes and water will flow into that solution. So this 3% solution has a higher osmotic pressure than this 0% solution, right? This has a higher pressure. So one way you can think about it is if you didn't want water to move in here at all, when you put it in here, you would have to apply a lot of pressure on here so no water would move in because it will want to move from that higher water potential to that lower water potential. So Higher pressure means you're more hypertonic. If you talk about um, water potential, that means you're less hypertonic. I know it's a lot of words, but I'll be going over them with you. Okay, so let's take a look at this. Here we have now some bacteria, okay? And I know, uh, or it could be a plant cell. Oh no, it's labeled bacteria. Oh, I'm bright like that, okay? And the reason I said it could be bacteria or plant cell is because there is a cell wall. Okay, there is a cell wall. Now keep in mind, you could have a cell wall made of peptidioglycan, it could be made out of cellulose, okay, but it's going to resist the influx of water. It's going to push back, and when you measure that pushing back, that is called trigger pressure. So let's look at three different scenarios that this bacterial cell is in. First of all, if this bacterium is sitting in a solution that is hypotonic, remember water must flow from the hypo, water will, net movement will be in. Will water move out of the bacterial cell? Yes, it will. Just not as much as what's moving in. The net movement will be in. Now, if you put a bacterial cell in an isotonic solution, the same amount that's moving in, because iso means same, same, the same amount moving in is equal to the amount moving out, so you will see no change. If you put the cell into an hypertonic solution, remember, water must flow from the hypo. So if this bacterial cell is sitting in a hyper, real salty solution, then water from the bacterial cell is going to leave it. And that's what you can see happening here is this cell membrane is all shriveling up away from the cell wall. All right. 
So we use dialysis tubing to model what would happen in a real cell. Okay, so let's take a look here. This is a red blood cell and this is a plant cell. Now, if you don't know this, red blood cells are biconcave discs that helps them to increase surface area, um, carry about 250 million molecules of hemoglobin inside them and move through the smallest capillaries. All right, now here is a plant cell and here's the plant cell wall. Do you know what all these little green looks like discs in here? Do you any idea? Hopefully you said chloroplast, right, for doing photosynthesis, but you can clearly see the cell wall. Now, this isn't an isotonic solution, same, same. So everybody's fine here, right? The, the pressure is equivalent on either side. The water potential would be equivalent on either side. Now, when you look at this, here is a drawing now of what you just saw. So the same amount of water moving into that red blood cell is moving out. Same thing here, same amount of water moving into that plant cell is also moving out. Do you know what, oh, well it's labeled for you. This is the large central vacuum, okay? Now, let's contrast that, okay, to a hypotonic solution. Now, our red blood cell is not a biconcave disc, it is blown up, and in fact, if you continue that, it will actually burst, right? And you don't want that to happen. That's one reason not to stick yourself with a syringe of distilled water, right? When they give you an IV, if you need an IV because you've had blood loss or water loss, then they're giving you a solution that is isotonic to your red blood cells or to the plasma that is surrounding your red blood cells. So this is in a hypotonic solution. If you look here, the chloroplasts are all smished to the side because you have this large central vacuole. So go to your notes. I gave you a chart in the notes, solution around the cell, and the first solution around the cell says hypotonic. A hypotonic solution around the cell means that solution that the solute is down and the solvent is up. See my arrows? So water flow will be into the cell and the cell will become larger, right? So this cell is becoming larger and it will in fact burst if it, if possibly. This cell, plant cells won't burst. They do better in those scenarios because they have a cell wall. So on your terms, I wanted you to know cytolysis is in animal cells if it bursts as water enters. Um, it's called hemolysis if a um, red blood cell bursts. So cytolysis, the cell is lysing. Turgor pressure is a plant cell wall, pushes back against the pressure of the water entering and it prevents bursting. All right, let's look at a drawing of that. So this is, you know, there's nothing to push back, so the cell explodes. Here you have a cell wall and it's stretching out there, but it's not going to burst. Okay, opposite scenario, hypertonic solution. So now our red blood cell is sitting, it's hypotonic because the solution around it is hypertonic. Water must flow from the hypo, so water's leaving our red blood cell and going out of it. Where you can see over here, here's our cell wall, Look at our cell membrane. It's shriveling up inside the cell wall because the vacuole and all the chloroplasts are getting all clustered together because the vacuole has lost all of its water to that hypertonic solution. That's why if you live somewhere where it's really cold and they um, salt the grass, then, uh, or sorry, salt the roads because they're trying to melt the ice, um, then it kills the grass along the edges because it becomes a very hypertonic solution where the, where the grasses are growing. Okay, let's take a look at that. So here we can see more water is leaving than entering. And then when you look at this scenario right here, you can see the vacuole is shriveled up. So on your notes, you have hypertonic. That is when the solution, I'm referring to the solution as hypertonic. So it has high solute, low solvent, and water flow is out of the cell and the cell will become smaller. Now, a plant cell is not going to become smaller, but it is going to wilt. That's what plant cells do when they don't have any water in their vacuoles. There's nothing pushing up against their cell walls and they start to collapse. So crenation is when an animal red blood cell shrinks. Plasmolysis is when a plant cell membrane pulls away from the wall because the vacuole is becoming smaller. And then I already gave you isotonic. Osmotic pressure is equal on both sides of the membrane, and so there's no net change in an isotonic solution. And then I gave it to you right there. It's a 0.9% sodium chloride solution is what you would need in an IV in order to have an isotonic solution to your red blood cells. Oh, and here, why does the salt bother the snails? So hopefully you're not 
mean, but maybe you did this when you were a little kid, slugs or snails, and you would put salt on them. Okay, I'm not saying to do that. Please, I'm not saying to go kill snails. But why does it kill the snails? Because you make the outside of their snail body all salty and the and the fluids around the outside of their body. So water must flow from the hypo. So the water in their cells leaves and goes out to where the salty area is that you've salted around them. So that's why it bothers them, okay? If you wanted to make a uh, pickle, if you don't know this, pickles are formed from cucumbers. So what kind of solution would you need to put in your pickle jar here if you wanted to turn this cucumber into a pickle? What kind of solution? Hopefully you said hypertonic, right? Because it was a hypertonic solution, right? Water must flow from the hypo. It'll leave the cucumber and it'll shrink down to pickle size. Now, if you put dill, the seasoning dill in there and salt, it'll be a dill pickle. If what you do to make a hypertonic solution is um, sugar, then it will be sweet pickles, all right? so. Um, here's a little chart that explains that. It's also um, in your book as well. And so that's just for some reference for you. All right. Now, um, I'm going to take a little side note. This is not group shared notes here. Um, we're going to hit this in class, but I wanted to use this opportunity to talk about water potential just a little bit as a precursor for your lab. So in water potential, this is really when you're referring mostly about uh, things that have cell walls. Water potential is equal to two factors, pressure potential and solute potential. Solute potential is what we've already talked about before, like how much salt, how much sugar is in it. The pressure potential is referring to cell walls and their ability to push back. So if I drop a chunk of potato in this beaker, okay, this beaker, there's no pressure getting applied to it. It's just atmospheric pressure. So the pressure of this water in this beaker is zero, right? It would be different if I went out in space or went down in the water or something. Okay, so this is zero. And because it is pure water, remember what I told you, pure water has water potential of zero, no solutes in it, right? So this is zero, no pressure, no solutes in it, pure water is zero. This chunk of potato that I just cut off, off of a potato, and I drop this chunk of potato in this solution, okay? Um, keep in mind that as soon as I put the potato in there, it already had its water potential before I put it in there. And that is equal to the pressure potential. Well, when I first cut the potato, there's no pressure. And, um, and it's solute potential. Well, because there are molecules and sugars and starches inside those cells, its solute potential is not zero because it has things dissolved inside of it. It's negative three. So the potato is negative three and the beaker water is zero. Remember, water must flow from the hypo. It's gonna go from higher water potential to lower water potential. So our, our highest water potential is zero right here, and this is negative three. So water is gonna keep flowing in that potato, right, until it starts blowing up the potato cells, and the trigger pressure is gonna increase as the cell walls start to push back. When the cell walls push back, plus three amount of pressure, then no more net change is going to happen, right? Because even though this is still, it has more solutes in it, right? It still has more solutes, more stuff in this potato. The wall is pushing back. It's pushing back a factor of plus three. So plus three and minus three is what? Zero. So now the water potential on either side now is zero to zero. So it will stop the water flowing, okay? Now let's look at another scenario, okay? Oh, I need to be smaller. Okay, so again, here's a beaker, pure distilled water. Pressure is zero, solute potential is zero, so the water potential is zero. Now, we're gonna put this plant cell inside this beaker of water. Now, at the time I dropped it in there, its cell walls were not pushing back, its pressure potential therefore was zero, but it has dissolved molecules in here, so its solute potential is negative two. So zero plus negative two, right? Pressure plus solute potential is negative two. So which way is the water gonna move? Water's gonna move just like it's drawn right here into the plant cell. And it's gonna move into the plant cell until the cell wall starts pushing back plus two bars, that's how you would measure it, um, bars of pressure back, 
right? So it's pushing plus two, it wants to come in minus two, now we're zero, and that's the same as the distilled water, okay? Um, take a look at this one. Now, I don't have pure distilled water in my beaker, okay? This has got, like, say, a bunch of salt in it, okay? So much salt in it, it's still, there's no pressure on the beaker, but the solute potential is negative 12 because I put a ton of salt in there. And I'm dropping this potato in here. And this potato has the more things in it. This particular potato, let's say I let it sit outside and dry out. So it already has lost a bunch of water. I this just a chunk of potato. I left it on my counter overnight. It lost a bunch of moisture to the air all night. But so this potato is at negative 15 for its solute potential. So as soon as the pressure potential, as the water comes in here and it starts pushing back to plus three, minus 15 plus three is minus 12. It's same, same on either side. Will water stop moving? No, water will continue to move, but the same amount moving in is also moving out. Sorry, my phone was getting blown up, which was on my watch. All right, now, not to freak you out, we will talk about this in class and you will talk about it with a teacher in um, a lab situation, but these are the equations that you will find from the College Board. We've already seen this, so this is not intimidating. Water potential is pressure potential and solute potential. We're fine with that. The water potential will be equal to the solute potential of the solution in an open container because the pressure potential in an open container is zero. Okay, we already talked about that. Now, if you wanted to calculate, let's say some plant tissue solute potential, you would have to calculate that out. And this is the equation that you use. It's, let me, let me get bigger just for a minute, okay? The equation that you use is negative ICRT. Okay, and you're like, what does that mean? I'll tell you, okay? In a lab, this is what they would test you on. And if you were not distance learning, if you were in class, we'd be doing a lab on this right now. I would have you take chunks of potato and put it in different molarities of solution. And I would have you put them in there, let's say overnight. And you would weigh the potato before and you would weigh the potato after. And you would see where are the potatoes gaining weight in what solution and what potato are they losing weight. We would just graph that, okay? And from that, we would infer at what molarity of solution would it neither gain nor lose? Because if it's not changing, then we know, right, that the pressure is equal on either side. So we can use that molar concentration to calculate water potential, okay? So let me show you that right here. Oh, come over here, stay. Okay, so if you look right here, okay, negative ICRT, I is the ionization constant. Sugar doesn't ionize, so it'd be one. Salt does ionize, it's two. And you just need to make sure you remember to put a negative sign in front of it. C is the molar concentration. So let's say it was um, 2.3 molar solution that it didn't gain or lose any weight. We inferred that because we graphed it, you know, and we looked at that. So then you would plot your, put your molar concentration in there. R, it is always 0 0.0831 liters per bar per moles per Kelvin, okay? That's just gonna cancel everything out, right? Um, and when you look at moles per liter is moles, right? So just trust me, they all cancel out. We'll talk about it in class. And then temperature is Kelvin. Kelvin is whatever the degrees Celsius it plus 273. So if it was like 30 degrees Celsius, it would be 30 plus 273, so 70, 80, right? So 303, did I do that right? So then you just multiply that together and you'll calculate the solute potential. And keep in mind, if your pressure is zero, then you know the water potential if you can calculate the solute potential. Now, I'm not going to ask you to do anything that hard right now. We will talk about it in class, right, and talk about it relating to labs. But I just wanted to start to introduce that to you because that's a critical part of um, understanding why water moves. So let's do a simple, simple one. Look at this question I gave you right here. If a plant cell's pressure potential is two bars and its solute potential is negative three bars, what is the resulting water potential? Okay, so look at your equation right here. Water potential is pressure potential plus solute potential. So you should be able to do this, right? I've given you the pressure potential and I've given you the sol solute potential. So let's go to the next slide. Okay, so there you can see the water potential would be two bars plus negative 3.5 bars, right? 
because this is the pressure potential plus the solute potential. So the resulting water potential of our particular plant is negative 1.5 bars. That would be predicted, right? Because remember, pure distilled water, the water potential is zero, right? Anything that has something in it is gonna go negative. So now let's put another scenario here. What if you put this plant right here, whose water potential was negative 1.5 bars, and what if you put that plant in a beaker, and that beaker's water potential, right, which would just be a factor of its solute potential because there is no pressure, was negative 3.5 bars. What would happen to that plant? Would that plant grow or would that plant get smaller? By grow, I mean would water move into it or would water move out of it? Remember, water must flow from the hypo. It's always going to go from a higher water potential to a lower water potential. So can you figure that out? I hope you figured it out. Okay, so here I did a little lame drawing for you, trying to help you, okay? Um, so if you look right here, and I explained it over here, but I'll use this drawing over here. So here's your plant. I told you that its water potential was negative 1.5 bars. The solution out here was negative four bars. So which one has the higher water potential? Which one's closer to zero? The plant, right? So the water potential is greater in the plant cell than in the solution around it. Water must flow from the hypo, so the net movement of water is going to leave that plant and go out into the solution around it. So I like tried to draw a little membrane here. It's gonna go from negative 1.5, water's gonna move into that negative four, okay? All right, so that's a little introduction into water potential. All right, so when we talked about before, oh, let, me, let me move here. How'd you do on that? Did you do okay? Hopefully you didn't freak out or anything. All right, so looking at this, we talked before about, um, about passive transport. You're just going from a higher concentration to a lower concentration, either through the phospholipid bilayer or you use a channel or a carrier, as long as you're going with the gradient. So when you go with the gradient, which is what's happening right here, this looks like a carrier to me because it actually looks like it's binding to it. It's going from a higher concentration to a lower concentration. Remember, we call that facilitated transport. So on your notes, uses a carrier facilitated transport, it's underneath our chart above 5.3, uses a carrier protein that is specific for the substrate being transported, okay? The protein may undergo a conformational change during the transport. This one clearly is, he's looked like he's going from here to here, right? Okay, um, so facilitated transport, you can see this here, these look like rocket ships, I guess but whatever molecule they are, they're going from a higher concentration on this side to a lower concentration using a carrier. So that is facilitated transport. Now, um, active transport. Active transport is when you go against the concentration gradient, when you go against the concentration gradient. So to me, this is the inside of a cell and this is the outside of a cell right here. So where are these orange balls more concentrated, on the inside or the outside? So hopefully you're saying on the inside, right? So now we are using, when you use a carrier, um, it's called a pump, right? If you, it's called a pump if you have to use ATP to make it work. So in this case, we're trying for some reason because we want this molecule, we want it inside the cell. So it's gonna go and bind onto the carrier protein. And there's also a place for um, a phosphate group from ATP to bind as well. And when that binds, then you will move this carrier and it will put it against the concentration gradient. It will concentrate it on one side of that membrane. So in 5.3, active transport across a membrane, energy is required. Molecules moved against their concentration gradient. Molecules moved against their concentration gradient and it requires carrier proteins and ATP. It requires carrier proteins and ATP. These proteins are called pumps. These proteins are called pumps. The pump you want to know for sure is the sodium potassium pump. You got to know that over 30% of your D, uh, sorry, of your ATP that you make in your mighty mitochondria is for all your sodium potassium pumps on all your cell membranes in your body. So, um, when if you look on your notes i have sodium potassium atp ace ace okay it's the same protein it pumps i believe i have a picture let me just check here oh by golly i do okay so it is tiny it's not the greatest picture but i'm sure you can google one right here so here 
you can see this sodium right here is going to bind on. Okay, look at this ATP donating a phosphate and becoming ADP. So it's right, so it's ATP ACE. That makes sense. Remember, we learned about ACE enzymatic, right? So it's binding on here. Then it's going to release those sodiums, right? To the, in this case, it'll be the outside of the cell. And then it now has binding sites available for the potassium. And it does three sodiums out. And then these two potassiums are going to bind right here. And then they're going to be released to the inside. So three sodiums out, two potassiums in, three sodiums out, two potassium in. This is going to create um, a gradient where you have more positive charges outside than inside. This has a lot to do with nerve function. And I'm going to just put a pin in that because I'm going to come back to that later. Okay, because it's going to create this gradient across this membrane that you can use for work. So on your notes, go to sodium potassium ATPA, sodium potassium pump. Same protein that pumps three sodium molecules to the outside of the cell, pumps two potassium ions to the inside using ATP. This sets up an electrochemical gradient. An electrochemical gradient. Membranes become polarized that all neurons, nerve cells require to function. Okay, and then you have NaCl transport is important to many cells. Sodium is actively transported and chloride ions will passively follow. And we'll, fo we'll look at that too. Okay, we look at it especially in the kidney. All right, hard part over, okay? Um, bulk transport. So your choices is through a phospholipid bilayer, that's one way to move, using a channel or a carrier passively, or using a carrier actively requiring ATP, right? Or you can use whole membrane. Whole membrane, when you engulf something, is called endocytosis, and there's different categories of endocytosis. And when you bring a vesicle to the edge of the cell and throw it up to the outside, that's called exocytosis. That should be easy to remember. Endocytosis in, exocytosis out. So there's just different categories of endocyt um, endocytosis and exocytosis. So I think I gave you the whole definition already for exocytosis, a vesicle formed by the Golgi apparatus. You know what that is, like the postman. Fuses with the plasma membrane to secrete substances such as hormones and neurotransmitters and enzymes. Endocytosis, we have um, three different ones we're going to talk about. Phagocytosis is cellular eating, like something large, like um, if a white blood cell ate a bacterium. Okay, here you can see um, an amoeba is starting to eat a paramecium. That would be considered phagocytosis. Okay, so sorry about that. Phagocytosis, cellular eating, large molecules engulfed. Pinocytosis is cellular drinking. So it's still taking a whole membrane to go and get it. And obviously this is active transport because you've got to move your cytoskeleton and everything to go out and engulf these things. But when you're bringing in fluid, that is called penocytosis and that is cellular drinking. Okay, and that's used by plant root cells. Okay, this I believe is a capillary and that also happens across some of our capillaries is penocytosis. All right. This is my favorite one. It's called receptor mediated endocytosis because it is exactly like what happens. In this situation, what you have is you have a cell membrane and things are just attaching onto it, like ding, 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 ding on the receptors. And when the receptors are full, then it folds in and it does its um, endocytosis. So you can see them on here. And this is called a coated pit because it's coated with whatever is binding it, right? And then it does endocytosis, and then you have that substance inside. So receptor-mediated endocytosis, it's a form of penocytosis, a specific macromolecule binds to receptors, selective and more efficient than penocytosis. Selective and more efficient than penocytosis, and it's used to move substances um, like from maternal to fetal blood. All right, then the next thing you will note is um, mini-me. Okay, and that's because these are not parts you have to have to know for the AP exam, but sometimes they do reference them. So I'm going to blow through these pretty quickly. Um, oh, sorry, here's your receptor mediated endocytosis. Okay, but animal cell junctions, we touched on this a little bit um, earlier. We don't have cell walls to hold our cells together, so we have various junctions. 
And this junction right here is an adhesion junction. You have parts of the cytoskeleton going between two plaques. Here you're sharing proteins, that's called a tight junction. And here you're sharing channels. Your channels are lining up between two cells. So that's called a gap junction. So these are different ways to anchor. So again, you can see the adhesion junction. It's like the cytoskeleton. It, the filaments are crossing between two cells, holding those cells together. Here's a tight junction where you don't want leaks, like maybe your bladder, okay? Um, and then here you have gap junctions, and that's where um, molecules can move from one cell to another. It would be kind of like, yeah, you, you got that, I'm going on. All right, um, I have all of that in your notes. Um, I'm not having you learn all of that, nor will I assess you on it, but I feel bad if I don't I'm gonna share that with you, okay? now. When we've gone outside the cell, so far all we've looked at is the glycocalyx with the carbohydrate side chains um, that are either glycolipids or glyco glycoproteins, depending on what they're attached to. But it's messier out, that, out there than those simpler diagrams that we were showing. Here you can see the cytoskeleton. You can see part of these filaments attached to these proteins. And then you have different things out here. You have things like elastin um, that is out here, and that's for resilience, right? I have less elastin lasting because I'm getting old. And so what am I going to get? Wrinkles. Yes, I already have them. You have molecules out here, proteoglycans and items that are used for cell signaling, um, for communication, collagen, things like that are used for strength. So those are additional proteins or carbohydrate side chains that are on the outside. And remember, we called that the extracellular matrix. And we talked about that in part one. Okay, last thing, oh, you're doing awesome. Okay, so the next thing we need to talk about is uh, plant cell walls, okay? And here you can see, here's your plasma membrane, here's your primary wall. This could be between one wall and another. Not a super helpful picture, I know. I'm gonna move past that one, okay? But what I want you to see right here is between plant cells is you have to have a way for solutions to move from one plant cell to another plant cell. But if you've got this wall, then you wouldn't be able to have any, you know, you would have a harder time with solutions moving. So there's like little doorways, little interior doorways called plasma des desma or plasma desmata. And, and, and you could envision like if you've ever been in a hotel and you have two rooms, but you have that adjoining door between those two rooms, that's what they are like. Okay, and here's another picture, so you can see that a little bit better. Okay, so here's, you can see the cell wall, okay, and the cell membrane is running just to the inside of that, but this little opening, this plasma desma, allows solutions to move back and forth. So, on your plant cell, war, uh, plant cell walls, um, porous varies in thickness depending on function. The primary wall, the first wall, contains cellulose, it is formed first and pectins allow for flexibility. Later polysaccharides will harden and mature the cells. Um, a secondary wall, now keep in mind, if it's gonna build a secondary wall, it can't build it outside because there's nothing out there to build it, right? It has to build its secondary wall from the inside. So it has its initial wall, and then it builds a secondary wall inside the barrier of the first wall. So the secondary wall is formed um, to the interior of the primary walls in woody plants, like trees and things with bark, right? Okay, bark's another whole thing. It contains more cellulose and lignin. And then plasma desma um, or plasma desmata um, are narrow membrane line channels that pass through cell walls of neighboring cells and connect their cytoplasm and connect their cytoplasm. And thank the Lord, that is it, the end. Hopefully you learned all kinds of stuff. All right. Oh, where's my turn off button somewhere over here? Okay, we're good.